The torque converter transmission is one of the devices designed to transmit power to engine-driven forklifts. The torque converter transmission consists of a torque converter that transmits power by means of fluid and a transmission that is operated by hydraulic pressure. This video uses as an example the torque converter transmission made by Aishin Seiki, which is installed in the one to three ton engine driven forklifts with pneumatic tires. The torque converter transmission comprises three main sections. The first section is the torque converter. The engine power is transmitted to the torque converter first and then relayed onto the transmission by means of the fluid inside. The engine torque is amplified at the same time. The second section is the transmission. The engine power transmitted by the torque converter is switched either to the forward or reverse gear before being transmitted to the wheels. The third section is the hydraulic control unit. This unit controls the hydraulic fluid for switching the transmission to the forward or reverse gear. We will study these three components in more detail. This is the torque converter. The torque converter consists of the pump impeller, turbine runner, and stator. The pump impeller is integrated with the drive cover and connected to the engine crankshaft via the flexible plate. The turbine runner is connected to the power input shaft of the transmission and the stator is installed to the stator shaft via the one-way clutch so that it rotates in one direction only. The torque converter is sealed and filled with torque converter fluid. We will now see how the power is transmitted. This is the pump impeller. We will fill it with fluid and rotate the impeller. As you see here, the fluid runs out along the veins and case due to the centrifugal force. The fluid collides against the veins of the turbine runner. The fluid force causes the turbine runner to rotate. This means that the power has been transmitted from the pump impeller to the turbine runner by means of fluid. Now, let's see how the fluid flows within the sealed torque converter to transmit power and amplify the torque. As we saw earlier, the fluid squirts from the pump impeller and hits the veins of the turbine runner, causing it to rotate. Since the torque converter is completely sealed, the fluid returns to the pump impeller. We will now see how the fluid returns to the pump impeller. As you can see here, the fluid returning from the turbine runner is flowing in the opposite direction of the rotation of the pump impeller. This reduces the torque rather than increasing it. Let's see what will happen when you install a stator between the pump impeller and the turbine runner. As you see now, the stator reverses the direction of the fluid returning from the turbine runner, and the fluid is now flowing in the same direction as the pump impeller. The torque is increased now because the pump impeller is driven by the engine power plus the fluid force. 
the turbine runner increases its speed to a point near the speed of the pump impeller. At this stage, the fluid returning from the turbine runner is hitting the stator, as you can see here. This means that the stator is an obstacle to the flow of the fluid. But, since the stator is fitted via the one-way clutch, it begins to rotate due to the fluid force. As a result, the fluid keeps flowing without interruption. As the stator begins to rotate, it no longer increases the torque, and the torque converter only transmits the power. As we have seen so far, the torque converter transmits the engine power steplessly to the transmission while amplifying the torque at the same time. Look at this graph now. It shows the performance curve of the torque converter. To understand this graph more easily, let's compare it with the animation. Numbers along the horizontal axis represent the ratios of revolution speeds of the pump impeller and the turbine runner. And numbers along the vertical axis at the right show the power transmission efficiency between the pump impeller and the turbine runner. This point in the curve shows the pump impeller and the turbine runner and the flow of the fluid under the conditions that you see now. The efficiency increases as the revolution differential between the two parts decreases, but then the curve begins to decline. It goes down because the stator is interrupting the flow of the fluid returning from the turbine runner. The graph rises linearly at this point. This indicates that the stator is rotating by the force of the fluid. The time during which the stator remains still is called the conversion range. The time during which the stator is rotating is called the coupling range. The point at which the stator begins to rotate is called the clutch point. Numbers along the vertical axis on the left are the ratio of the torque being transmitted from the pump impeller to the turbine runner. You should understand here that the torque no longer increases beyond the clutch point and only the rotation is transmitted. Let's look at the transmission next. The transmission consists of the forward input gear that is fitted to the input shaft. the reverse clutch and the clutch gear, and the forward clutch, and the forward output gear are fitted to the clutch shaft. The transmission also includes two idle gears, and an output gear. Each pair of gears are engaged with each other. We will now study clutch construction and operation. This torque converter transmission has two hydraulically operated multi-disc clutches. The clutch drum contains a clutch piston. And the clutch piston is held down by a spring. Clutch plates are assembled inside the clutch drum.
and clutch discs are assembled between the clutch plates. The forward gear is splined with the clutch discs. The same construction is seen in both the forward and reverse clutches. Here, the power from the input shaft is being transmitted from the clutch drum to the clutch plates. Let's see what happens when pressurized fluid is introduced to the clutch piston. The fluid causes the clutch piston to move to the right and causes the clutch plates to engage with the clutch discs. Therefore, the power is transmitted to the forward gear. When the pressurized fluid acting on the clutch piston is removed, the piston is pushed back to the left by the spring. As a result, the clutch plates are separated from the clutch discs and the power is not transmitted to the forward gear. We will now look at the hydraulic control unit that controls the forward and reverse clutches. The hydraulic control unit is incorporated in the upper cover assembly of the transmission and it consists of several valves. The internal valves include the regulator valve that regulates and maintains the pressure in the circuit at nearly a constant level. The selector valve that switches the oil passage to the forward or reverse clutch, whichever is selected by the shift lever. The modulator valve and orifice valve that reduce the clutch engaging shock. The change valve that switches the oil passage to the modulator and orifice valves according to selected direction. The inching valve which allows fine travel control in relation to the inching pedal angle. The lubrication change valve that directs the lubrication oil to the engaged clutch, shaft, bearing and other parts as determined by the selector valve movement. The variable orifice valve, the check valve and other valves. This model shows the hydraulic circuit in the hydraulic control unit. The circuit is made up of many components, including the oil tank, oil pump, regulator valve, inching valve, modulator valve, orifice valve, variable orifice valve, change valve, selector valve, forward clutch, and reverse clutch. Now that we know the names of all the components, we will study the movement of individual valves, the flow of fluid within the hydraulic circuit, and the operation of the transmission. The fluid is supplied by the oil pump and its pressure is regulated by the regulator valve. This valve maintains the oil pressure at a specified pressure to protect the entire circuit. The fluid then travels through the inching valve and to the selector valve. 
It also goes to the modulator valve chamber. Now we will assume that the shift lever is set to the forward position. The selector valve moves upward and opens up the oil passage to the forward clutch. The fluid also flows to the change valve and causes the change valve to move upward. And the fluid is sent to both ends of the modulator valve and the orifice valve. The fluid causes the modulator valve to go down. The drain port, indicated by the arrow, opens as a result. And allows the fluid in the circuit to flow to the drain circuit. The oil pressure decreases inside the circuit as a result. The fluid which flows toward the orifice valve goes through the orifice indicated by the arrow and enters the modulator piston chamber. The fluid causes the modulator piston to move upward. And it pushes up the modulator valve via the spring. Therefore, the port indicated by the arrow is closed gradually. And the pressure inside the circuit rises. The clutch is engaged as a result. Since the fluid continues to flow into the modulator piston chamber, the modulator piston is pushed up completely. As a result, the drain port is closed completely. The modulator valve and the orifice valve are designed to maintain a very smooth clutch operation without any unpleasant shock. The orifice valve has two orifices of different diameters, and either one may be selected by the forklift operator to alter the timing at which the fluid enters the modulator piston chamber. In this way, the operator can set the forklift wheels in the quick start or the slow start mode, whichever is more appropriate. Now, using this model, let's see how the power is transmitted after the forward clutch is engaged. This picture shows the mechanism in the neutral position. We have marked the gears contributing to the power transmission to help you understand the power transmission more easily. Now that the forward clutch is engaged, the power is transmitted from the input shaft to the forward input gear. To the forward gear. And the forward output gear. Through the two idle gears, and to the output gear. The power causes the wheels to move forward. When the shift lever is returned to the neutral position, the selector valve switches the oil passage from the forward clutch to the drain circuit. The hydraulic pressure decreases inside the circuit and disengages the clutch. The power is no longer transmitted to the wheels. Now let's see what will happen when the operator sets the shift lever to the reverse position. 
the selector valve moves downward and opens up the oil passage to the reverse clutch. The change valve moves down simultaneously. All the valves perform their functions as in the forward clutch operation and the reverse clutch is engaged smoothly. As the reverse clutch is engaged, the power is transmitted from the input shaft to the reverse gear through the two idle gears and to the output gear. The power causes the wheels to move backwards. We have just reviewed the movement of the fluid in the hydraulic circuit for forward and reverse operations and how the transmission operates when the clutches are engaged or disengaged. We'll now study the function of the inching valve. When the inching pedal is applied while the forklift is traveling forward, the inching valve moves down. The oil passage, indicated by the arrow, closes a little, and the amount of fluid flowing to the clutch decreases as a result. As the inching pedal is pushed down all the way, the port indicated by the arrow is closed, and the return port opens. The hydraulic pressure acting on the clutch decreases, and the clutch is disengaged temporarily as a result. When the inching pedal is released, the oil passage is opened up as before, and the clutch is engaged again. This allows the operator to alter the pressure that acts on the clutch by the force with which he pushes the inching pedal down. This allows the operator to have better control over slow forklift travel. The inching pedal is connected to the brake pedal via a linking mechanism. Therefore, the brake is applied also when the operator presses the inching pedal. When the inching pedal is pressed down all the way, the inching valve also moves down all the way and closes the oil passage shown by the arrow. Since the oil passage to the drain circuit, shown by the arrow, is opened up completely, the pressure no longer acts on the clutch. As a result, the clutch is disengaged completely. Since the clutch is disengaged and the brake is applied as soon as the inching pedal is depressed, the clutch is protected from a large load when the brake is applied. We just studied the relationship between the inching valve and the clutch. In reality, the inching valve has two valve spools so that the inching feeling remains the same regardless of the engine speed. The hydraulic unit also contains a circuit for supplying lubricant to all parts of the torque converter transmission. You have just learned about the construction and functions of the torque converter the transmission, and the hydraulic unit. Finally, we'll review important points in servicing forklifts having a torque converter transmission. As you saw earlier in this video, the torque converter transmission is operated by hydraulic pressure.
Therefore, when servicing a forklift equipped with a torque converter transmission, you must check the engine first, then check the main pressure, the clutch pressure, and the outlet pressure. If no problem is discovered in these checks, the next troubleshooting step is a stall test. The stall test is performed to identify whether a trouble exists in the torque converter or in the transmission. To perform a stall test, you put a load as close as possible to the permissible load on the fork. Then apply the parking brake completely. And place blocks under the front and rear wheels so that the forklift does not move during the test. After warming up the engine, check if the torque converter fluid is up to the specified level. After confirming that the engine is operating normally, set the shift lever to either the forward or reverse position. Depress the accelerator pedal all the way. And record the engine RPM in that condition. If the engine RPM is lower than the specified stall revolutions in the forward and reverse positions, you may suspect a locking problem of the stator in the torque converter. In other words, the one-way clutch may be malfunctioning. If the engine revolutions are higher than the stall RPM in the forward position, you may suspect a failure of the forward clutch. If the engine revolutions are low in the reverse position, there may be a failure in the reverse clutch. These are basic steps that you will follow to inspect forklifts having a torque converter transmission. In this video, you have learned about the construction and functions of the torque converter transmission and key points in servicing them. But please remember that this is only fundamental information about forklifts having a torque converter transmission. It is important that you refer to a variety of other manuals and materials to further increase your knowledge about them.